Father God, what a story you have woven together. What an amazing tapestry that you have put together. God, that people like us have a place in your kingdom. That people like us can be called sons and daughters of the living God. That people like us can now be the hands, the feet, and the voice of your son Jesus to continue the work that he began so long ago. God, we are privileged and blessed and we stand in awe of what you have called us to do. Lord, this morning may we look into Matthew 14 and be challenged. May we look into Matthew 14, Father, and if the need be, may we be convicted. Father, may we look into Matthew 14 and, Father, come to an understanding, the same understanding that the disciples had as they bowed down in that boat as your son Jesus had calmed the seas. They worshiped him because he truly was the I am in flesh. God, may we see you for who you truly are. May we see your son Jesus for who he is, God living amongst us. And Father, may we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, God living in us, so that we might serve your purpose as well. Father, would you bless every church in our community? Father, our brothers and sisters who are this morning proclaiming the gospel up in Aden and Beaver, right here in our city limits, God, out in Herlong, over the hill, in Westwood and Chester. God, we are part of this amazing family that extends beyond these walls, that extend beyond this county, that extends beyond these United States. God, God, unite our hearts so that we might be your people. One voice, one mind, one faith, one baptism, one church, of which the gates of hell will never push us back. Thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning to you all. Glad to be here. Glad that you have chosen to worship with us. Um, This morning we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. And uh, by way of review, we've been looking at Matthew's story. Matthew has written down this gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news of Jesus Christ, because he wants his people to know the story. The story is, this one named Jesus is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. He has come to save us from our sins. He has brought with him a kingdom, and it's not the kind of kingdom you think. It is a heavenly kingdom that is beginning to take place here on earth. And last week in chapter 13, Jesus told seven kingdom parables. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is this, the kingdom of heaven looks like that. And Jesus explained two of them. In each of these parables reveals the contrast between those who are in the kingdom and those who are outside of the kingdom. As we well know, not everyone living in the realm of God's kingdom has chosen him to be their king. Each of those seven parables had a different context, but the theme was the shame. And what was the theme? God has sown his message, and the devil has sown his message, And it's up to us to decide which one will take root in our hearts. It's up to us which message will take root and grow and flourish and change who we are. That's what was in chapter 13 last week. And then as we close the chapter, Jesus returned to his hometown, Nazareth. And there he was met with skepticism. There he was met with ridicule. And in Matthew 13, 57, 56, and 57, it says that the people of Nazareth were deeply offended by Jesus, by his message, by his words, by his deeds. They were deeply offended and they refused. That's a choice, church. They refused. They said, I won't you. I will not believe you. So Jesus could only do a few things there because they were morons. It's a loose translation, but it fits. So this morning, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. 
Those who bring you a Bible, you need your Bible, raise your hand nice and high. If you don't own a Bible, you keep this Bible, it's yours, you bring it back next week, and you go ahead and feel free to read it during the week. So if you need a Bible, raise your hands, turn to Matthew chapter 14, and let's begin with a birthday party gone bad. Any of you ever been to a bad birthday party? Well, John the baptizer was part of a bad birthday party. And so what we read here in verses 1 to 11, Jesus again moves from teaching in parables as we looked at last week to now we see another narrative of events. Last week he was teaching, he was explaining his parables. This week it's Jesus went here and he did that. Jesus went over here and he did this. We are returning to a narrative of what was going on. And so we begin with verses 1 to 11 with the narrative of Herod's birthday party. Herod Antipas was ruling part of Israel in Judah. And so he had married his brother's wife. Him and his brother's wife, they apparently got together. She divorced her husband. His name was Philip. That was Herod's brother. Herod divorced his wife. And so he married his sister-in-law. And so John the baptizer, who was under arrest, began to tell Herod and his wife, Herodias, this is not a good thing. I'll leave that alone. I just think about my sister-in-law, but that's fine. I'll leave that alone. John the baptizer had been telling Herod and his new wife, this is not good. This, what you're doing is immoral and it's sinful and it's against God. So what happened was Herod had a birthday party, and Herodias, who had a daughter by Philip, Herod's brother, she came in to dance. And she danced for Herod's birthday. Now a lot of churches, a lot of uh, people get caught up when this is why we don't dance, because things happen. There's even some, a group of people, who doesn't celebrate birthdays, partly as a result of this passage of verses. But here's the thing. The problem wasn't the dance, but the problem was Herod made an ill-thought-out promise to his wife's daughter. Her dance pleased him so much that he looked at her and said, ask anything that you want of me, up to half of my kingdom, and I will give it to you. Church, when we say things that are not thought through completely, when we share things that we have not... um, that we're not confident about, when we share things that shouldn't be shared or foolish words such as Herod did, that causes problems. So what did Herodias' daughter do? She went to her mother and said, what should I ask Herod for? And And her mother said, ask for John the baptizer's head on a silver platter. Well, Herod had made this big boast in front of all of his birthday guests. Ask me whatever you want. Oh, but don't ask for John's head because I'm not going to do that. So because of his foolish promise, because of his ill thought through words, John the baptizer lost his head because Herod made a foolish promise. Not because of the woman's dance, not because of the birthday party, But John the baptizer lost his head because Herod made poor promises. Church, we have to guard our words. We have to watch our words because you never know when somebody will lose their head as a result of what we've said. So, that's what happens in verses 1 to 11. Now we move to verse 12 and we see this. Later, John's disciples came for his body. John the baptizer's disciples came for his body in verse 12, and they buried it. Then they went and told Jesus what had happened. Now remember, John the baptizer is Jesus' cousin. Verse 13, as soon as Jesus heard the news about John the baptizer being beheaded, it's bad enough to hear that somebody has died, much less to hear that someone has been beheaded for their faith says that when Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area. Now, if we look in uh, the Gospel of John, I think it tells us that he went up to Bethesda once again. 
he went to a remote area to be alone. And we're not exactly sure why Jesus went from down here in uh, Nazareth, where he was at, back up to Bethesda, but he did much of his ministry up in here in the northern part of, of the Sea of Galilee. So we're not exactly why Jesus, sure why Jesus withdrew. Maybe to mourn John's death. Secondly, to avoid more attention from Herod. Jesus thinking, wow, Herod, you know, he's kind of on a, on a bender right now. I need to stay away from him. But what happens from this point on is that Jesus pulls back from proclaiming his kingdom to the nation of Israel. From this point on, Jesus now focuses on teaching the 12 because his time is getting shorter and he needs to invest in his disciples. So that's where we come to faith lesson one. Matthew 14, verse 13. But the crowds heard that Jesus was, the, but the crowds heard where Jesus was headed up to Bethesda to be alone, remember? The crowds heard where he was going and they headed there and they followed him on foot from many towns. So there was quite a crowd running along the shore as Jesus sailed across the Sea of Galilee. Others were running around the shore to meet him. Verse 14, Jesus saw huge crowds when he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them. If you've been paying attention, this phrase comes back again and again. Jesus had compassion on the people, and Jesus saw the crowd, and he had compassion, and Jesus saw the boy, and he had compassion, and Jesus saw the woman, and he had compassion. Jesus is a compassionate Savior. As we pray for others, Jesus is a compassionate Savior. And we know that God is compassionate because Jesus is compassionate. We know that God cares for us because Jesus cares for us. We know that God wants to be involved in our lives because Jesus wants to be involved in our lives. He is the reflection of his Father in every way. When Jesus saw the huge crowds wanting to go be alone, wanting to go mourn John's death, Jesus sees the crowd, he has compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Verse 15, that evening the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, we're in a remote place. It's already getting late. Look at that in verse 15. I never noticed that till this week. Jesus was so caught up in the healing, he lost track of time. He, they had to come say, hey, Jesus, it's getting late. Well, Jesus was in the midst of ministering to people. Jesus was in the midst of loving people, and he lost track of time. I really desire that for my own self, that I would be so involved with people doing God's ministry that I lose track of time. Usually when people come in my office, I'm going, yeah, okay, and what happened? Yeah, it's hard. So Jesus loses track of time. I was being, that was sarcasm. Because <laughs> some of you might have been thinking about making an appointment with me this week. I was, I was being sarcastic. Come in my office, I'll embrace you. I'll, you come in my office, I'll take my watch off. I won't even... I won't even look at my watch, so, all right. So, Jesus lost track of time. They were in a remote area. The disciples reminded him, maybe because they were getting hungry. So the disciples said to Jesus, send the crowds away to the villages to buy food for themselves. Now look at verse 16, because this is very important. Jesus said, this isn't necessary to send them away to get food. You feed them. In the original language, this is emphatic. You you and you and you, all 12 of you, you feed these people. They weren't expecting that. They weren't ready for that. But Jesus, as I said, is now focusing his attention on the 12. And look what happens. They forget what happened in chapter 10. Remember in chapter 10, Jesus sent the disciples out. He says, I'll give you power over demons. I'll give you miraculous powers to heal people. Go out and do ministry in my name. See, they had forgotten the power that Jesus had already given to them. They had forgotten what they were able to do back in chapter 10. And so Jesus says, now you feed them. And the disciples, had they been paying attention, so they said, okay, Let's do something. Who's got some fish and bread? And the disciples would have grabbed those, those two fish and those five loaves of bread, and they would have done the miracle. But they forgot what power they had. In church, we forget who we serve as well. And we forget the power that we have. 
because the first time the devil throws a monkey wrench in our Christian life, oh, woe is us, man. We crumple up and we get in the fetal position on the floor. We have power because he who lives in me, lives in me, is greater than he who lives in the world. We need to live like that, not just have that be a theological understanding in my brain. That needs to be a daily lifestyle that comes from my heart, from what I really believe. So, verse 17. The disciples said, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. You know what I love about the disciples? They're just like us. They always had an excuse. Yeah. I want you to go over here and do this ministry. Oh, but, but I, I don't have a car that runs. Well, I want you to go. I want you to step out in faith through this. Oh, but somebody's already doing that, God. We all, we, oh, but, 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 we, but, 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 but Jesus, but, but all we have is two fish and five loaves. When is that not enough when you're serving Jesus? But Jesus, I only have this. Let me tell you, church, that's enough. That's enough. So they said, you know, they were smart guys. They found that little boy whose mother really loved him and packed him a lunch. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Matthew doesn't tell us that part of the story, that it was a boy in his lunch. Then verse 18, Jesus says, bring it here. Bring it here. Bring me the food that you have. Verse 19, take a look at this now. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. So it must have been springtime or at least summer. Jesus told the people, sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up to heaven to let the people know God was a part of this miracle. He looked up to heaven. He blessed the food. Then, breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. We always have abundant provision. We always have abundant provision. They ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. So, some people say, well, they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers so all of the disciples would learn a lesson. That's not necessarily true. It could be. But most scholars believe that the reason they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers representing the 12 tribes of Israel, what Jesus was signifying in this is that he is sufficient for all of Israel if they would but choose to follow him. And they would not. They would not. Verse 20, they ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up, picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to the women and children. So we're looking at 10,000 plus easy. 10,000 plus easy. And they did it with two fish and five loaves. You know, we did over 6,000 lunches this year. We still got a ways to go, but we can do it in Jesus' name, amen? We can do it in Jesus' name. So, the miracle is a faith lesson for us. The situation before us may look daunting, it may even look impossible. Our limited resources are always more than enough when placed in the hands of a compassionate Savior. Our limited resources, the meager talents and gifts and abilities that we bring to God's table is always enough. We should never look to the door that God's opened for us and say, but God, we only have two fish and five loaves. We should never say, but, 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 but. What we have is enough in the hands of a compassionate Savior. What we lack is the same thing the disciples lack, stepping out in faith and believing that we are empowered to do what God's called us to do. He's not going to call you to it if he's not going to give you what you need to do it. He's not going to call you if he's not going to empower you. Faith lesson one. Now let's move on to faith lesson two. So the first miracle that the disciples saw, feeding the five thousands, that assured them that they were following the right person. Just They were sure they were following the right person, the one who could abundantly provide for their needs. But this second faith lesson 
shows them that not only can he provide, but he can protect, and as I said a moment ago, empower us, empower us. So verse 22, chapter 14, immediately after this, immediately after he fed the 5,000 plus, Jesus insisted your version might say Jesus made the disciples get in the boat. Now, if you go to the Gospel of John, I think, what you see is the people that he fed, they were ready to make him king by force. If you go to John, you'll read that. So Jesus got the disciples in the boat, said, get out of here, get going. Jesus dismissed the crowd. Immediately, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back in the boat, verse 22, cross to the other side of the lake. While he sent the people away, he, he sent the people away. After sending them home, he went up to the mountain to be by himself, to pray. Night fell while Jesus was praying. Finally, solitude. Finally, solitude. Jesus finally gets to be alone with his father. He finally gets to mourn the death of John the baptizer. Exhausted from hearing the news, traveling from Nazareth up to Bethesda, exhausted from healing now he is renewed and replenished verse 24 so while jesus is chasing away the uh whoops i'm backwards there while jesus is chasing away the crowds being alone with his father the disciples take off in the boat verse 24 meanwhile the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting mighty waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. Disciples were struggling in the boat, having a tough time, seasoned fishermen, having a tough time on the Sea of Galilee, losing control of their boat, fighting the wind, fighting the waves, probably fighting each other. They were in dire straits. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came forward walking on the water. Whether it's 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, church, Jesus is aware of what's going on. He's aware. They were unaware that this man approaching them, this ghost, unaware that it was Jesus, but he was so very aware of their situation. And we can take solace in that. We, we can take rest in that. We can take refuge in that. Jesus is aware of where you are this morning. Jesus is aware of what's hurting your heart. Jesus is aware of what's causing you anxiety. Jesus is aware of what is bringing you joy. He's aware. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. They were unaware of his awareness. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. You see what happens when we don't trust Jesus? It brings us fear. In their fear. Jesus is but a few yards away from the boat, but yet they were still fearful. Jesus is living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help is but a few words of prayer away. And like the disciples, we again are unaware. In their fear, they cried, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. He said, don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. What's significant about this passage is that Jesus says the same words that God spoke to Moses back in Exodus. God said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and rescue my people. Moses says, "How will, who, the people won't believe me because, you know, I'm just me, Moses. I'm a regular guy. And he says, when the people of As Israel ask me, what is his name, the one who sent you to rescue us from Pharaoh? What should I tell them, Moses says in Exodus chapter 3? God said to Moses, here's what you tell them. You tell them that I am sent you. You tell them that I am sent you. You know what Jesus tells the disciples in the boat? Take courage. I am. I am. 
It's God in the flesh walking on the water to rescue the disciples. Oh, that's powerful. See, they just thought it was Jesus. They just thought it was the special rabbi. We often wonder when it was exactly that the disciples came to faith because we never see them go to the altar to accept Jesus. We never see them say the sinner's prayer. I think I found the spot where the disciples get saved. You see, I am has come to them. And the thing is, Peter sort of gets it, and that's good. Because it's better to sort of get it than not get it at all. So the other 11 weren't quite sure of what was taking place. Peter at least sort of gets it. And it was the beginning of Peter being convinced of what he was a part of. It was the beginning of Peter being convinced that there is more to this kingdom than we really understand. It's the beginning of Peter understanding that Jesus had actually called him to something special. And it holds true for us. We have been called to something special. But we have to be convinced of that sometimes. And this is the way it played out for Peter, verse 28. Then Peter called to him, I like this part, Lord, if it's really you, that's really you, Jesus? Then you tell me to come out on the water. I just wonder what Jesus was saying. Really, Peter? If it's, if it's really me? Get out of the boat, brother. Get out of here. Jesus says, verse 29, yes, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. I don't know what transpired in these few moments. I don't know what the 11 guys on the boat were thinking. I don't know what Peter was thinking. But man, I'd have loved to have been there to see what all, how that all played out. <laughs> yeah, come on, Peter. And Peter walked on the water toward Jesus. Church, as long as you're walking towards Jesus, nothing is impossible. As long as you are walking toward Jesus, the biggest mountain, the deepest valley, the biggest heartache, the greatest disappointment will not stop us if we're walking toward Jesus. Jesus. But Peter being human and all, verse 30, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, Peter got terrified and began to sink. See, Peter was like a little toddler that a mom and dad teaches to walk. And this is what was happening with Peter's faith. He had this little bit of faith and he was just learning to walk in his faith. And Jesus patiently was working with Peter to grow his faith and to deepen his trust in the Savior. But Peter's physical eyes became larger than his spiritual eyes. And when our physical eyes overpower our spiritual eyes, we begin to look at all that's happening we begin to look at all that's going on. We look at situation after situation after situation. And we throw up our hands and we say, woe is me. And we sink into the quagmire of this world. I don't know if you've seen any of the events in Virginia. But this is a horrendous situation in our nation. These are terrible times of division. But I'll tell you what if we would simply walk towards Jesus once again. It would resolve so much of what's going on in this nation. Because this is always going to be around us, church. There's always going to be wind. There's always going to be waves. There's always going to be rough seas. But if we walk towards Jesus and not let our physical eyes overpower our spiritual eyes, we will do well verse 30 b save me lord love that prayer you remember the prayer when jesus was sleeping in the boat and they were in a storm that prayer was a little different save us lord here it gets personal save me lord peter shouted jesus immediately 
reached out and grabbed him, said, Peter, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? And I have to be honest with you. This is where I live. I have so little doubt or so little faith, and often I doubt. That's where I live. I'm a human being. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. You would think I've learned some lessons along the way, and I trust that I have, but I'm not where I want to be. I'm better than I used to be, but I'm not where I ought to be, where I want to be. You see, the problem was not Peter's faith. Whether it was a little or a lot, the problem was Peter's culpability. (laughs) Peter let himself get distracted. I let myself get distracted. You let yourself get distracted. That's an everyday occurrence in my life. You see, the problem was that Peter's faith was supplanted by doubt. They failed to remember what Jesus had given to them in chapter 10. Go preach the gospel. Go heal the sick. Go work miracles in my name. And they forgot all that they had previously done. But in spite of Peter's doubt, I'm sure that his faith walk was catapulted to the next level. Even three steps on the water kind of boosts your faith, I think. (laughs) So, verse 32. When they climbed back into the boat, That's Jesus and Peter. The wind stopped. Storm was over. The minute Jesus got in the boat, the storm was over. So what response is appropriate after Peter walks on the water, Peter loses his faith eyes, he sinks, Jesus rescues him, Peter and Jesus get into the boat, and the sea is as calm as glass. What's the appropriate response? Just think about that. Worship. It's worship. And as I said earlier, where did the disciples come to faith? I'm not absolutely positive, but I think verse 33 is a good starting point. Then the disciples worshiped Jesus. You really are the Son of God. Conversion, salvation, life transformation, right there in the boat. (laughs) You really are, I am. You really are more than a great teacher. You really are more than a great rabbi. You really are more than a magician. You are God in the flesh in our boat. And we need to worship you. The storm stills. The disciples, with reverence and understanding, their faith reaches a new plateau. The very Son of God, God in the flesh, exercising power and authority right before their eyes. You see, the Christian life is like walking on water. It's humanly impossible. It can only be lived in the power of the Spirit. We try to live it in our own strength, and that's just a train wreck. We try to follow God in our own strength and we get distracted and we try to follow God uh, by sheer determination of gritting our teeth and clenching our fists and we try to follow God and it doesn't work out well. As long as we look to Jesus, as long as we move towards Jesus, we can experience a supernatural life. But the minute we become occupied with ourselves, the minute that I become more important than what he's called me to do, the moment that I become distracted by my circumstances or by the devil's enticements, the moment I get drawn away and my eyes move, we falter and we sink and we must cry out to Jesus for forgiveness and restoration. So, two faith lessons now we come to the conclusion is he holy god or is he just a healer or is he just a helper verse 34 
After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Genesaret, which they were up there in Bethesda area. Now they come over here to Genesaret. Jesus continues his works of compassion. It's been a big previous day. It's been a pretty big night in early morning. And now Jesus again lands on the shore. And verse 35 tells us, when the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly through the whole area. And soon the people were bringing their sick to be healed. They begged Jesus to let the sick, to let the sick touch at least the hem of his garment. And all who touched him were healed. This is a very significant contrast. For the people of Genesaret, Jesus was healer. He wasn't holy God. He wasn't Lord. He wasn't Savior. He was healer. Dr. Meadows is healer, but he's certainly not the Son of God. For the 5,000 that Jesus fed, he was helper. Oh, this is good. We're out here in the middle of nowhere. Jesus has been with us all day long, and now he's going to help us by giving us dinner. Jesus was helper. Jesus was helper. Jesus was healer. But for his disciples that day, much different than the people at Genesaret who saw Jesus as healer. Much differently than the previous day where even maybe the disciples saw Jesus as helper. They had a brand new understanding of this one that they were following. He is holy God. And that changes everything, doesn't it? When you follow a healer, when you follow a helper, when you follow a self-motivating speaker, when you follow a sports team, when you follow a celebrity, nothing compares to following holy God himself and recognizing that in your own life. Worship team, come up. We need to close. So what's the takeaway this week? Number one, like John the baptizer, we have an enemy. We've looked at this a number of times. We've used this a number of times now in the book of Matthew. We have an enemy. He will use anything, anything to silence us. He will use anything to trip us up. So church, expect opposition and don't cry when it comes. Be prepared for it. Be ready for it. Empower yourself to get through that opposition because it comes to all of us. We have an enemy. Secondly, our gifts, talents, resources, and abilities are of no value in the kingdom of God until they've been placed in Jesus' hands. No matter how amazing musician you are, no matter how amazing speaker you are, no matter how deep a theologian you are, no matter how great a missionary you are, until you put what you have in the hands of Jesus, it's of no value. A cooperative work, being of value in God's kingdom, is a cooperative work that comes from a surrendered heart it's a cooperative work. My surrendered heart placed in the hands of Jesus. Amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. My unsurrendered heart in my hands, not much happens from that situation. Thirdly, our faith must be firmly placed in Jesus. Our spiritual eyes must be set on Him because any distraction in our faith, can sink us. Any distraction can sink us. Fourthly, Jesus was and is holy God in the flesh. Who do you believe he is? Holy God? Healer? Helper? Good luck charm. Associate. You see, the church and many Christians 
have a poor view of the Savior. Uh, he's my good luck charm. He gets me out of messes when I make a mess of my life. Oh, Jesus is a healer. I mean, look what he did this week. So we'll wait till we're sick to engage Jesus. Jesus is a helper. Jesus, I need a new job. Can you help me? Jesus, my kids are becoming prodigals. Can you help me? See, is he holy God? Is he healer? Is he helper? Is he lucky charm? And if he's anything in your life less than holy God, then your struggle is real. Your struggle will continue. Your Christian walk will have problems. Your faith will be weak. And the things that God has called you to, to accomplish within his kingdom, will not get done. So, this morning, our behavior reveals what we believe. The behavior of the disciples in the boat, it revealed what they believed. You are holy God. You are the Son of God. You are I am. Their behavior reveals what they believe. What does your behavior reveal about your belief, church? What does your behavior reveal about your belief? I hope you see Jesus as holy God. I hope that he's more than healer. I hope that he's more than helper. I hope that he is more than lucky charm. Father, as we sing this last song, would you remind us of its truth? Father, speak to us in these moments. Meet us in our chairs. Meet us at the altar. Meet us in our hearts. Amen. So this morning, this song, I believe, is about the disciples. Because there was a point in this study this morning where they surrendered all. Is there a point in your life this morning where you need to finally, at last, completely surrender all? I trust that if you have a need this morning, or you have something that needs to be reworked in your heart, reworked in your mind, that you would make it right. Let's stand, sing with Randy and the team.